First Corinthians 15, second half of it, verses 35 to 58, and we've called this a messy church longing for the resurrection. If in the last year I've, I was going to say read a book, it was on Audible, in case you have to say listen to a book, but listen to a book called The Body Keeps the Score. Have you ever read that? Interesting, helpful, hard. And it talks about how often our bodies carry the weight and the pain and the trauma of life's mess. That if we have been through abuse, if we've been in war, or just from the stress and the overwhelmingness, and even just through age and tiredness and being battered by life, our bodies feel it and kind of gather it up. And maybe some of us even here have said, I just wish I could have a new body. Never said that? And the glorious reality for Christians is that one day we will have a new body. The Christian hope is not a kind of airy, fairy, flying around in clouds and rainbows with a little harp kind of thing. The Christian hope is more like, oh, baby, do you know what that's worth? One day heaven will be a place on earth. But folks in Hope Community Church Corinth just couldn't get their head around that. They were skeptical. They even doubted the need of this coming resurrection. And so at the end of this chapter, right at the end of the book, Paul is telling them two things that are going to happen. He says, look, guys, one, our bodies will rise. And then two, death itself will die. And this is really good news this morning. If you are feeling broken or spent or burst or battered by life. If you're overwhelmed, if you're in constant pain, if you feel like you're always battling, if you feel like even your body itself is falling apart, then listen to this message. Because as Carson says, you're not suffering from anything a good resurrection won't fix. And so let's work through this together, first by reading what God says, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we read from verse 35 through to the end of the chapter, verse 58. So 1 Corinthians 15, start in verse 35, for this is God's word. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have when they come? You fool, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you're not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed perhaps of wheat or another grain. But God gives it a body as he wants, and to each of the seeds its own body. Not all flesh is the same flesh. There is one flesh for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from that of the earthly bodies. There is a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from another in splendor. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Like the man of dust, so are those who are of dust. Like the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep. But we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. 
Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Father, what amazing words even to read this morning. And so Lord, I just pray that anything I say won't detract from that. But Lord, you would, in the power of your spirit, take these words and put them in us so we would know Christ and be living, longing for the hope of his resurrection in us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the first thing we see is that Paul is saying, our bodies will rise. That's verses 35 to 49. And remember, as we've been going out through 1 Corinthians, we've said that the key problem of the Corinthian church is they have what we call the kind of over-spiritualized eschatology. What we mean by that is that they were looking that everything was going to be spiritual, right? So that they, they kind of had come to know Jesus, and so they were kind of talking in tongues of angels, and they were, they were thinking they had this spiritual existence. They didn't need their bodies anymore, and as they hoped for the future, everything was spiritual, nothing was physical. When they thought of bodies, they thought of decaying corpses, right? So what, what's the point of this? We don't need this anymore. This thought of this rising is just weird. We can all eat spiritual beings. But verse 35, Paul says, Look, someone will ask, How are the dead raised? What kind of body will they have when they come? Skeptical questions, unbelieving questions. They don't believe that God can raise these bodies. Right? It's a lack of faith is the issue here. That's why in verse 36, Paul says, You fool which is a bit of a harsh answer to the question, right? They're like, oh, is this going to happen? And Paul's like, you fool! Like, I pity the fool. Okay, Paul. But he's actually using the Old Testament category there of fool, which is someone, if you've read through Proverbs, someone who doesn't have God in the picture, someone who's looking at life without taking God into account. And that's what they're doing. They're thinking of the future, not in God's terms, but in their terms. And so Paul then uses three analogies to make the point. God already brings life through death. God already has designed different bodies for different purposes. So the first analogy is the planting of seeds. Verse 36, Paul says, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And you are not sowing the body that will be, but only a seed. But God gives it a body as he wants, and to each of those its own body. Point is, this principle of, of transformed life through death is already hardwired into nature. Right? We already see this happen like in normal life. Maybe not for me, who's not a farmer, but if you're a gardener even, you've had the process of taking little seeds and putting them in soil and leaving them, and from that little seed transforms this plant or this tree or this meadow or this life. Like, what on earth is going on there? Like, if you think about it, it's mental, right? Like if you didn't know that was going to happen and someone gave you a little seed and then you said, right, put that in soil and then you're going to get a tree out of it. You'd be like, no chance, Pete, you're off, you're rock or what is going on? Because it's mental. And yet it happens. This little seed is a picture that God does amazing things, even transforms life through death. And that is Paul's point. You don't bury the tree, you don't bury the plant, you bury a seed. And then it is transformed into something even more glorious. Paul is saying, yeah, the bodies we bury here are yet seeds. What will rise is transformed, is glorious. So the planting of the seed is the first image that shows this is already something that we get. Second thing he draws out is the design of animals. Like Corinthians can't get their head around this idea of having different bodies for different needs. Okay, a body for this life, a, a body for eternity. Like, what, what? Truly, there's just one body. And Paul says, no, there's already different bodies for different needs. So verse 39, not all flesh is the same flesh. There is one flesh for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. Point is, God is a majestic artist, 
And he has designed different bodies for different purposes, even here and now. And so, in the same way, verse 40, Paul says, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is different from that of the earthly ones. So yes, our heavenly body will have a continuity between what our bodies are now. They're like a seed. That seed has still got everything in it that is going to continue. There's a continuity, but there's also a difference. There's a redesign, if you like. This body that will rise will be fit for purpose for eternity. It will be physical, yet it will be spiritual. It will be glorious. None of the weaknesses or pains of these bodies will be in the bodies that will rise. But notice Paul doesn't say that our current bodies don't have any splendor or don't have any glory. He says they're just different. These bodies are glorious, but they're, they're different. They're maybe nothing to do with what's to come, but they are still important. It's like a caterpillar and a butterfly, right? A butterfly is so much more glorious than the caterpillar, but a caterpillar is still pretty awesome. I mean, you don't love a good caterpillar, right? I mean, who doesn't? And so the point is, we're meant to take care of these bodies as well. Right? It's not that life here and now is, is you come to Jesus and then everything is spiritual. Who cares about your body? Wait for what's to come. That's what the Corinthians have been doing. Paul says, no, that's not what it is about. And that is a key question for us as well, right? Are we taking care of these bodies? Am I taking care of my body? Third analogy is the design of planets. To reinforce this point that God has different glorious designs for different specific purposes. Verse 41, he says, There's a splendor of the sun, another of the moon, and another of the stars. In fact, one star differs from the other in splendor. Again, Paul's point is, look all around you. Why are you doubting that God can raise your current body and transform it into a specifically designed, spiritual, eternal, glorious body? The evidence, Paul says, is everywhere. Look at seeds. Look at animals. Look at planets. Look at the stars. God designed this world to point us to the next world. We see that throughout. We see like in the joy that we crave and we sample in part now, that is the joy that we'll forever have when Christ returns. Or the beauty we see and enjoy now is but a Polaroid of what we will one day see in full technicolor. And these resurrection images, the intricate designs of planets and animals and the seeds that we see now are but a glimpse of what is to come. And Jesus returns and makes everything new. Because, verse 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual and even more glorious body. Paul says that is fact. That is true. If you're in Christ, that is what is to come. But then, if that wasn't enough, he lands the knockout blow to their skepticism and doubt because he says, look, you're doubting this, but this has already been proved because you've already seen this in Jesus. Verse 45, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Language there is a bit complicated. It's a bit hard to translate some of that into our language. He's not saying Jesus is the Holy Spirit, right? How many persons are there in God? Three persons, one God, right? So Jesus is different, distinct in person from the Holy Spirit. He's also not saying that Jesus didn't have a physical body. He's saying, basically, that what is true about Adam's body for us now will be true about Christ's body when it rose. He's comparing Adam's physical body with Christ's resurrected body. So, for instance, verse 47, the first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Not from in as much as origin, as much as Adam's body was designed for earth, and Christ's resurrected body was designed for eternity. He applies that to us in verse 48. And so then he says in verse 49, Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, 
we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. So Paul's continuing this kind of Team Jesus, Team Adam picture from last week, that idea of who is your federal head, who is your captain, your representative. And his point is, look, we're all born into Team Adam. We all were born with Adam's body. But all of us who are in Jesus will rise with bodies patterned after Christ's resurrection body. And he's saying, why, why don't you get this? Why, why don't you see this has already happened in Jesus? Jesus has already shown you a resurrected body. And that chain reaction we talked about last week, that when Jesus rose, it was then cast iron certain, guarantee that all of his people would one day rise. That means because Jesus had a resurrected body, it is now guaranteed that we will too. And as we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus' resurrected body had continuity. There was parts that were the same. He had a physical resurrected body. He could be recognized by those who followed him. You could even see the scars from the cross that was on him. He even ate food with his disciples. There was continuity between his body, but it was also just completely different and better. Like it seemed like he could walk through walls. Like that would be kind of cool if we get to do that. Like I don't know if we'll get to walk through walls, but our bodies are going to be so perfected and amazing from what we know now, patterned after Christ. We're not sure what that'll be like, but we know it'll be physical and spiritual and glorious. And so Paul is saying in these first verses, 35 to 49, that yes, you will physically rise. And he's saying, yes, you will have a resurrected body. All of nature points to it, and a resurrected Savior proves it. And this is massive implications for how we think about life after death, doesn't it? For though we die, we too will rise. Our temptation is to either think about life here as just all physical here and now, or maybe to go to the other extreme and just think, well, life will be all spiritual after we die. And so if we're only concerned about life physically now, we don't believe in a life after death, then we'll do what we want. YOLO, we will live for me. We'll screw over others, even because if it makes me happy, it's not that bad. Like life is just physical. It's just now, that's all I've got to care about. Or we can go the opposite extreme. And when we think of the future, just think of kind of spiritual, kind of cute little angels and fairies. We're going to be like floating about or looking down on the stars, just kind of spiritual, cutting about up in heaven. It's going to be great. But actually that leads maybe to nice platitudes at funerals but very little, if any, solid hope. That's why when a lot of people think about heaven, they don't want to go. Sounds boring, sounds weird, religious -y. Doesn't sound real or fulfilling or joyful. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus rose physically because we will too. And if we are in Christ, if we are trusting in him, we will enjoy a physical, joyful, will be all one, paradise renewed, all things new, eternity. Right, let's read again verse 42. Sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. Sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. Paul is saying, look, our bodies will rise. And he's saying, secondly here, that death will die. If verses 35 to 49 were an argument of Paul, right, trying to sort their kind of wonky theology out, this is what's going to happen. Verses 50 to 58 are more just a kind of compelling overflow of this joyous expectation that Paul has. He's like thinking about what's coming for him and he's just blown away by it. And you can almost just see him stir up and sing because of what he's saying. Verse 50, he says, what I'm saying is this, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit in corruption. Now we have flesh and blood, right? That's the Bible's way of talking about this life and our flesh and blood now is weak and failing. It's corrupted. Your translation might say perishable. And we know that when we think about our life and our bodies, don't we? We, we feel that day after day. 
sin has made a royal mess of this life. This is not the world we all want. This is not the life we dream of. And we are victims of sin. Right? We, are, we have broken bodies. We have cancerous cells. We have abusive relationships that aren't our fault. Right? That are just part of living in this messed up world. We are victims of this sinful, broken world. But the fact is, all of us are also guilty of sin. Our bodies even are a mess because of what we put in them and how we abuse them. Our minds are screwed up because of what we fill them with. We hurt, but we also hurt others and even hurt ourselves. We are corrupted and yet we are corrupt. We are a decaying mess. And Paul says, therefore, in that state, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will have no hope for a better future. But verse 51 Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed. If we are in Jesus, if we have repented of our sin and brought it to him, then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, we will be changed. For the trumpet will sound, And the dead will be raised incorruptible. And Paul says we will be changed. Whether we die before the Lord returns and our souls wait in heaven for our resurrected bodies or whether we're alive when that trumpet sounds and Jesus splits the sky, if we are in Christ, we will be changed. Verse 53, for this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility. And this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. Like a glorious plant from an innocuous seed, our bodies will be transformed and renewed when Jesus comes again. Like the glory of planets and stars, our new glorious bodies will no longer then suffer the mortal ills of suffering and pain and death. Because on that day, When Jesus returns to make us and all things new, verse 54, then the saying that is written will take place. (coughs) Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? When Jesus returns, on that day, death itself will die. For verse 56, the sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is in the law. Death comes through sin, but sin is also the deadly poison that leads to death. Right? Brokenness, pain, the mess of this world is because of sin. It came through our rejection of God's way for our way. It's because we, as a as human race, have rebelled against the life giver and become life takers. Our lives are a mess because we are sinners. Sin is at the root of all of this, and sin is at the root of death. Death is here because sin reigns. But, verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. For today, there is forgiveness and hope and joy and victory given to all who flee from sin and run to Jesus. For Jesus and Jesus alone has defeated sin and hell and death. And how do we know that? And what is the proof that this is true? And the proof is Jesus is alive. Jesus has already won. As one of Justin's rapper friends says, Plato is dead. Socrates is dead, Aristotle, Immanuel Kant are dead, Nietzsche and Darwin are dead. However, Jesus is alive. Buddha, dead. Muhammad, dead. Gandhi, Joseph Smith, dead. Abraham, Guru, Nanak, dead. However, Jesus is alive. 
Jesus is the only one to have died, been buried, been placed in a tomb, only for him of his own accord to get up, get dressed, and walk right back out. Right? Death has defeated everyone else. It has defeated all the loved ones that we have and have lost. And one day, maybe even soon, it will seem to defeat us. But we know that almost intuitively because all around us, people are trying to stop it and reverse it. Right? Gym freaks try and outrun or outlift it. Health freaks try to undereat it. Others try and medicate it away. Elon Musk tries to outbid it. And we all spend a fortune to cover up the effects through Botox, so that might just be me, makeup, fashion, glasses, hearing aids, walking sticks, right? Not all these things are bad, but ultimately, none of these things will work. No one can give defeat death, right? The account I follow on Twitter from years ago is still true. You will die one day. But one person has already defeated death. And that is Jesus Christ our Lord. And therefore so will all who have by grace through faith been wrapped up in the victory that is his. That is why Paul is using these Old Testament verses from Isaiah and Hosea to literally taunt death. Where death is your sting? It reminded me of like football matches. And whenever your team score a goal, which admittedly for Motherwell isn't that often, but whenever you score a goal, part of you is celebrating how good the goal is. And then what's the other part of you do? Like you turn to the opposition fans, you're like, come on then! Right? And pure taunting death is great fun. Doesn't happen much again if you support Motherwell, but it's great. And I was thinking that's kind of what's happening. And then actually one of the commentaries I read after that picked up the same image and it said, it's as if we're singing... You're not stinging anymore, anymore. You're not stinging anymore. Right? And literally, in Christ, we can taunt death and all the effects of death because Jesus has won. Because of the hope of what's coming, we can sit about death. And we can endure the brokenness that's caused by it. For soon that battle will be completely won. Our bodies will rise and death will die. And therefore the question of this whole chapter then is are we in Christ? Are we choosing life? Are we in Adam and still on the way to death? For all of us are sinners by nature and by choice. We've all rejected God's way for our way. We've all told Jesus to do one. We all daily do me. And many of us, therefore, are enslaved by it. It seems that we can't find a way even to get out of it. And so destruction and punishment and death just feels inevitable to us. And if we are still wrapped up in sin than it is. But there is hope today if we are wrapped up in Jesus. Jesus took on a physical body. He lived the life we should live, perfectly following and submitting to God. He died the death we should die, taking God's wrath for our sin if our hope is in him. But he didn't stay dead. He rose on the third day to show that the victory is won, to loosen the hold of sin and death and hell. And today Jesus offers freedom and joy and life to all who repent and believe in the goodness of Jesus. To all who reject the way of death and follow the way of life. For all who flee from sin and run to Jesus. For all who pick up the cross and follow Jesus wherever he leads. We will know that our bodies will rise and death will die. But if you stay in your sin, you keep rejecting the way of your Savior. If you keep choosing death, then a worse death is coming. All the pain and suffering of this life is nothing compared to the eternity of hell that we all deserve. If we have rejected the life of Christ, hell is our eternal grave. 
And we will be punished rightly for all of our rebellion against our holy and good King. And so today, if you are still in your sin, we urge you, we call to you from Paul, trust in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus. When you are forgiven, when you are restored to him, you will then have a hope for this life and a hope for eternity that nothing else will ever give. And if you don't have that today, we would call you to today, even where you are, cry out to Jesus. And if you need to know more about that, come and talk to us later. But if you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, then today we can square up to death because we have a joyful eternity coming. Oh, baby, do you know what that's worth? One day heaven will overtake the earth. One day God will create a new heaven and a new earth and sin will stay in it no more. Then life will be physical and spiritual. Then life will be perfect forever. Then pain will stop. Tears will be wiped away. Addiction will end. Depression and all of our mental health struggles will be lifted. Exhaustion will be forgotten. Strife will be healed for fear is gone and hope is sure. Then we will live forever in the promised land of paradise long forgotten the new and improved Eden. And the best thing about it is then we will see our Savior's face. The one who died for us rose and we will see him if our hope is in him. For the best thing about heaven is not new bodies or a renewed land or all the fun imaginable. The best thing about heaven is that Jesus will be there and we will live forever in perfect, joyful relationship with him. That's why the old hymn writer wrote, The bride eyes not her garments, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze at glory, but at my King of grace. Not at the crown he giveth, but on his pierced hand. The Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. Jesus lives and we will live. Jesus rose so we will rise and see him and meet him and be forever with him. That is what is coming for us if our hope today is in Jesus. And so therefore, today, while we have it, Paul says, verse 30, 58, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work because you know that your labor, therefore, is not in vain. Christian, keep going. Don't give up. Though your body is weak and failing you day after day, go all out for Jesus while you have today. Know Jesus and make Jesus known. Like D-Day has come. The battle is won. V-Day is coming. We will know it in full. We are fighting a battle that he has already won. And so soon and very soon, our bodies will rise and death itself will die. Many of you will be happy to know that this is the last time you'll have me preaching here for a couple of months. And if you've heard me speak, thank you, Chris. If you've heard me speak, um, for the last couple of weeks, you'll see that I've been desperately counting down to my holiday. Life has been very busy, um, and I'm tired, and I'm fat, and I'm moaned. I just want to get the holiday, and I just want a break, and I just want to recover and recuperate, right? And I can, I can keep going, because I know next Friday is when we're going. And even greater way, how much more can we endure all the pain of today? Because tomorrow we will be in glory. All the worst days of this life are but the first words in the first paragraph in the first chapter of a book which contains a glorious story that will never end. We can keep going because our bodies will rise and death will die. 
So believer, though your body is carrying the pain and keeping the score of life in this sin-stained, messy world, take heart. Jesus rose and you will rise. Soon and very soon, paradise awaits and it's true. You're not suffering from anything that a good resurrection won't fix. Therefore, let us be a messy church longing for the resurrection. Father, thank you again for the beauty and the hope of your word. Let us pray that each of us today would renew our hope in Jesus. That we would see that all we have ever longed for is found in him and one day soon we'll know it in full. Lord, if we are yours, keep us with that. And may we not be shaken despite all that life throws at us because of the hope of what's to come. And yet, Lord, if today anyone here does not know you, would they see just the hopelessness that's found in this life and today find a glorious resurrected hope that's found only in Christ? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.